Hello. Welcome to Charles City County, Virginia, just 25 miles outside of Richmond. My name is Mark Wilcox. I'm one of the rangers for Richmond National Battlefield Park. I'm standing in the front lawn of Westover Plantation. The Westover house behind me is a beautiful four-story uh, colonial era home made of Georgian brick. It was the home of the Berg family during the colonial period. It sits on a beautiful green lawn that sweeps right on down to the James River. But on January the 4th, 1781, a visitor would arrive here who ultimately would set Richmond, Virginia on its ear. Now when I say the name Benedict Arnold, most people think about one word, traitor, as indeed he was, a traitor to the American cause. But before he was an American traitor, he was actually an American hero, a major general in the American Continental Army and an aggressive combat commander full of vinegar. He helped capture Fort Ticonderoga at the beginning of the war. He would fight valiantly in the battles at Quebec and at Saratoga, where he would be wounded in both of those engagements. Ironically, both wounds would come in the same leg. I am convinced that had either one of those wounds been fatal, we would probably have a state named for Benedict Arnold. All across our nation, there would be countless high schools and elementary schools and county government municipal centers named in his honor. But that was not the case because he didn't stay the course. By 1780, he was a very naturally vain man who was seeking financial success, but he also felt that he had been bypassed unfairly for promotion by the Continental Congress. And so again, in 1780, Benedict Arnold will sell his soul to the British for money, and for a commission in their army, a commission as a brigadier general. Now remember, when he was serving in the American cause, he was a major general. So apparently, in order to become a traitor, it involved a major job demotion. In December of 1780, Benedict Arnold would receive his first command as a British officer, uh, about 1,600 crack troops, and they would sail with him from New York City down here to the Chesapeake, once arriving in the Chesapeake, they would transfer to smaller craft, head up the James River. Their target would be the state capital at Richmond. Now, Richmond hadn't been the capital for very long, less than a year, and it was little more than a village. About 600 people resided in Richmond, about 300 homes or, and other buildings, all wooden structures, or mostly anyway. And, um, but it, it was a small affair, but still it was up and coming. But Virginia had played a major role in the revolutionary cause, uh, a major role in providing men and munitions and equipment. By this point, a lot of those were being sent south to the Southern Army down in the Carolinas. But there was nothing that the British would like more than to knock Virginia out of the war. Now, as Arnold's forces are coming up the river, they do not go unnoticed. Uh, and word spreads to Richmond. Gallopers are sent with dispatches to Governor Thomas Jefferson of the British approach. But Jefferson believes that the British target will be Williamsburg. Uh, American uh, General Baron von Steuben believes that they're going to be heading for Petersburg. Both men will be flabbergasted when they learn that Arnold's force has landed here at Westover on January the 4th. So Jefferson is going to uh, uh, be roundly criticized for falling asleep at the wheel, for uh, getting caught watching the paint dry. But he will immediately swing into action and begin to have public stores and documents and munitions moved out of the city, namely across the river to Manchester. He will also take his family. He will move them out of the city. He'll send them west to Tuckahoe Plantation, to the home of the Randolphs, where he will join them uh, on the evening of January the 4th. But on his way west, he will stop six miles up the James River at Westham Foundry and begin the evacuation process there to move munitions, uh, badly needed supplies, uh, out of the hands of the British, if possible. Now, the Virginia militia will then be called out statewide, counties mustering their militias, but it's going to take time for them to mobilize and to converge on Richmond. Richmond is a part of Henrico County, and so the local militia, Henrico militia, will begin to gather on Richmond's uh, Chimborazo Hill 
Church Hill. At the time, they called it Richmond Hill. Uh, a smaller force under Major Alexander Dick will be sent east of the city to harass Arnold if he does indeed try to uh, march towards Richmond, but they are too few in number to accomplish very much. Arnold is going to land his forces here at Westover, and these again are track, uh, crack troops. Uh, it's uh, Loyalist troops and regulars. Uh, the Loyalists, the, the, the uh, Royal American Legion will march here. The Queen's Rangers, Mounted Dragoons, commanded by the very capable Lieutenant Colonel John Graves Simcoe. There's regulars. There's the 80th Richmond of Foot, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dundas. And uh, the feared Hessians are here. Uh, the crack German Jaeger Corps, crack shots with their short rifles. They're under the command of Captain Johann Ewald, uh, Ewald who will uh, write a, an account of his exploits in the American Revolution. Arnold will uh, get his troops together. He'll put them on the road uh, via modern day uh, Route 5, heading west toward Richmond. Alexander Dick's Virginia uh, militia will perhaps fire some scattered shots, but that's about all they can do. One thing they are able to do is to begin the destruction of the bridge over Four Mile Creek. That will be enough to stop Arnold, have him go into bivouac, and spend the night until the bridge can be repaired and he can resume his march. The Virginia militia will fall back and join their comrades on Richmond Hill. But Benedict Arnold has arrived, and he's on his way to Richmond. I'm standing atop Chimborazo Hill in Richmond, Virginia. It's a large grassy park, large hill that slopes down and overlooks Main Street. It's the home now of the Chimborazo Medical Museum, part of Richmond National Battlefield Park. But on January the 5th, 1781, it was a place where 200 local militiamen gathered in defense of their city as the forces of Benedict Arnold are approaching. Now these are not professional soldiers and terribly well trained. These are citizen soldiers. These are men from all walks of life. Um, dockhands maybe, merchants, farmers, mechanics, which is to say anyone who works with their hands. You know, up in Boston, Paul Revere, the great silversmith, was considered a mechanic because he worked with his hands. Uh, but these men are here in hopes of stopping uh, Arnold from entering the city. But uh, it's going to be uh, a tough day. You can imagine, as these professional soldiers are, are getting closer, you can imagine the men up here on Chimborazo Hill, called Richmond Hill at the time, uh, had some well-stretched nerves. Now Arnold's force will arrive and they will enter the city along Richmond's main street. That's basically going to be the route taken 80 odd years later by the Union Army as they enter Richmond in early April of 1865 at the end of the American Civil War. Now Arnold's troops will be moving into the city. Years later, the family of Elizabeth Agee uh, remembered she said she watched the British forces march by her front door on Main Street. She was living in Richmond's old stone house, considered to be the uh, oldest residential structure in the city. It's now the home of the Edgar Allan Poe Museum. As Arnold's forces are moving into the city along Main Street, he will look to his right along with other staff members, and they will notice the gathering of the militia up here on the hill, and that poses a threat. So Arnold is going to dispatch the Queen's Rangers and the German Jaeger Corps to ascend this hill in battle formation and disperse the colonial militia. It's not a battle that ensues. I'm not even sure if you can even call it a skirmish. Johann Ewald of the German Jaeger Corps would remember later that the militia here fired one ragged volley before fleeing into the woods. So ostensibly, the defense of Richmond has collapsed. Arnold has uh, the run of the city. Some of his forces, the 80th Regiment of Foot and the Royal American Legion, will enter the city, continuing up Main Street. The Queens Rangers and the Jaegers will head into the city uh, through Broad Street. The Queens Rangers are not done, though. They've had a long march, you know, from Westover Plantation. They're going to pick up another assignment to march another six miles upstream and destroy Westham Foundry. And they do just that. Most of, or a lot of the, uh, of the munitions have been moved. There's some that's left, there's some still there. That will be destroyed by Simcoe's Queens Rangers and the foundry will be burned before Simcoe will fall back towards Richmond. Arnold will establish a western perimeter, a picket, if you will, in uh, what was uh, Richmond's historic fan district today. But Benedict Arnold, the infamous guest, has arrived. How long will he stay? 
Stick around, you're going to find out. Welcome to Historic St. John's Church in Richmond. It's best known, of course, for Patrick Henry uh, standing up inside to say, give me liberty or give me death. That was in the spring of 1775. At that time, he was hoping to convince Virginia to take up arms, to consider joining a revolution, a war for independence. Almost six years later, Patrick Henry had gotten his wish. Revolution had arrived. Virginians had seen a lot of death at that point, but they had not secured liberty yet. And right here in this same churchyard, British soldiers passed through after having scattered the uh, local militia defense force on their way in to seize the little town of Richmond, which was Virginia's new capital city. The uh, capital had been in Williamsburg for a lot of years before that, so Richmond was really barely on the map uh, as yet. Uh, so there wasn't much of a developed city uh, really to attack. It did have some buildings that served as government meeting houses. It had some taverns uh, and a lot of places where you could measure and store tobacco. Uh, because Richmond, unlike uh, the other big port cities on the East Coast, is mostly a post-revolution city, um, there's not that much you can come to Richmond today and see that was here when the American revolutionaries uh, were here. Um, but this is one of those things that you can see, this church and this churchyard. Uh, Britons and loyalist Americans set up camp here. Uh, for a few days, they milled around, and they knew full well who Patrick Henry was and what he'd said here, and that he was now a fugitive enemy of the state. Um, and those Britons fully expecting to win a war uh, that was very much still in progress in the first month of 1781. Uh, the rebels now had a fighting chance, of course, because they had uh, secured the support of France uh, in their war against England. For the smattering of soldiers that were here uh, in this yard in January of 1781, um, it appeared that the revolutionaries were on the run. They certainly were here in Richmond, um, but it might have weighed heavily to know that uh, while you were here serving overseas thousands of miles away from home, you were also at war with France and actually now at war with Spain, closer to home. Uh, and this force, uh, for them here in the churchyard at St. John's, the immediate focus was taking the rebels out of the fight. There wasn't much of value in Richmond, of military value anyway, uh, but for the Loyalist Queen's Rangers, there was a more valuable mission at hand, a military target. Um, up the river. It's just a few miles away. Uh, there's a foundry. So there's no time for them to rest. Those light infantry soldiers, that kind of crack strike force, they went up the river. The bulk of General Arnold's forces settled in here for a couple of days. On the night of January 5th, Colonel Semcoe and the Queen Rangers went up the river to the Westham Foundry uh, with the mission there of destroying that facility, taking away its ability to produce cannons and ammunition for the Patriot cause. Uh, they're going to take that little side chip up the river and they'll be there for a couple of days. We're here just about five miles up the river from the sleepy little village of Richmond, where just over there uh, on this side of the river was the Westham Foundry. Work began there in 1776 to build a foundry where the raw iron from the western part of Virginia could float down the James River to be unloaded there before the rocks and the falls of the James blocked boats from getting any further down at the town of Richmond. It took a few years to get up and running, um, by 1779, cannonballs and artillery pieces were being made there and sent to the Patriot armies in the field. There were blast furnaces, there were workshops where they cast cannons and uh, drilled out their barrels, and of course there were places for the free and enslaved workers who worked there to live. In January of 1781, iron ore and weapons and gunpowder were piled up there, concentrated for the war effort. While General Arnold's men were in the town of Richmond, a few miles away, Governor Jefferson, with the workers, with the enslaved and the militia, supervised taking away supplies from the foundry on this side of the river to the other side in a hurry. The governor and the workers were gone when Colonel Simcoe and the light infantry got there after marching from Richmond on January 5th. Whatever was left, Simcoe's rangers destroyed. They dumped a bunch of gunpowder in the river. They set fire to the workshops and the warehouse and the foundry buildings. They destroyed 24 cannons and a bunch of muskets. In less than two days, their work was done. They were gone. They went back to rejoin General Arnold's larger force in Richmond. The foundry operation was never repaired. It didn't recover. The site was largely left in ruin for generations after that. And the entrepreneur who had dreamed up the idea of uh, building a settlement there and having a bustling manufacturing center on the James River died before the end of 1781. Next, we'll move on and see what General Arnold and the rest of the British force was up to in the little town of Richmond 
while Simcoe's Rangers were on this little two-day excursion. I'm standing in downtown Richmond at the corner of 19th and Main Street, just a typical busy city street. But in 1781, right behind me on the northwest corner stood a tavern, a very prosperous business owned by a man named Gabriel Galt, Galt's Tavern. It's also known as City Tavern. But on January the 5th, 1781, Benedict Arnold decided to make that tavern his headquarters and he will move in with his staff. Now, Arnold is going to write a letter to Governor Thomas Jefferson, who, if you remember, is still pretty much on the run, fleeing west toward Charlottesville with his family. But in this letter, Arnold is going to offer Jefferson a deal. He's going to propose that he uh, will spare Richmond, provided that the inhabitants of the city will do two things. One, stop shooting at him. And two, willingly offer up its marketable commodities, namely the city's stores of tobacco and rum, and pretty much anything worth cash money. This letter is going to reach Jefferson, and he is insulted by this and he is angered by this, and he is going to flat out refuse to cooperate, and he is going to send his own response uh, saying as much to, to uh, Benedict Arnold. I'm not exactly sure what the words were that Jefferson used, but I've always thought that perhaps it was similar to another surrender request put forth to an American commander during World War II when the 101st Airborne Division holding the town of Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge was offered a surrender request by the Germans. The temporary commander of that division, Brigadier General Anthony McCullough, sent a word, one word response, basically like this, to the German commander, nuts. I doubt if that's what Thomas Jefferson said, but regardless, his refusal enrages Benedict Arnold, and Arnold will order the sacking of Richmond. His forces will then begin to collect uh, that tobacco, those stores of rum and, and all other supplies. He, they're going to seize over 40 small craft in the river and actually put the stolen goods on board, send it downstream. The destruction comes next. The rope walk down at Rockets Landing, the port of Richmond, is going to be burned, as will all shipbuilding warehouses and all public buildings. The flames are going to spread because the wind kicks up and that fire is going to move from one building to the next. So much of Richmond will be destroyed. But there's one public building that winds up escaping the flames. It once sat at uh, 14th and Cary Streets in Richmond. It was an old tobacco warehouse. It was spared by Arnold because it was known to be the property of the British-owned William Cunningham and Company. What Arnold didn't realize was that it had been seized by Virginia's government and was then being used as the temporary state capital. There were public documents inside that building that were spared destruction because of Arnold's uh, cooperation with the Loyalists. Now to the west of the city, Arnold's picket posts were noticing some, noticing some activity. There's a buildup of militia units. Virginia's militia units have now turned out. Several hundred militiamen are gathering to the west of the city along with some Virginia Continental troops that were sent over by Baron von Steuben, the uh, military commander of Virginia. These men are, are collecting, they are moving very rapidly towards Richmond, and it becomes very obvious to Arnold's troops there that they need to fall back and they will be pushed back to the city, uh, to the city center, as a matter of fact. Now in Richmond's fan district, where probably this, this uh, event occurred, there is a granite marker. Uh, the original was placed there at uh, Mulberry Street and Grove Avenue in the 1830s. It began to crumble and it was replaced about 30 years ago, but it does commemorate this, uh, uh, this act. Now, most likely it's not in the right spot. We believe that Arnold's picket post was probably a little bit further to the west. But the, the sad thing is that it commemorates a Revolutionary War event that pretty much goes unnoticed in the city of Richmond today. Well, with Virginia's military might beginning to, to grow in strength and, and, and really pose a threat, Arnold realizes the time has come to probably vacate Richmond. The last thing he wants to do is to be trapped here. Arnold is a traitor. He's a wanted man. He knows this. There's a price on his head. You know, at one point, he had been good friends with General George Washington, but at this juncture, there was nothing more that Washington would have wanted to see than Benedict Arnold dangling from the end of a rope. 
And so very prudently, Arnold on January the 6th is going to collect his forces. They'll leave Richmond, march back to Westover, board their ships, and ultimately go back to Portsmouth. The raid is over. All in all, this is a, an embarrassing time for Virginia. Her capital city fell like a ripe plum before the invader with very little resistance. Its governor will have a stain on his record for a little while to come. But fortunately for Virginians, help is on the way. They were only a few months away from October 1781. Soon they will be cause to celebrate again in Virginia, across our, the colonies and the states, but chiefly in the small port town called Yorktown. On behalf of Richmond National Battlefield Park, thank you for joining us. We wish you a happy new year.